We hear all the time that history is literally right outside of the gate, and they're right. Not figuratively, literally. The front gate of the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, or SHAPE, is a few hundred yards down that street, and right here marks the location of the first clash between the British Expeditionary Forces and Germany in World War I. Now, there are monuments and markers like this one all over Europe. You can find them everywhere. And if we just go down that street and take a ride at that light, you'll hit Chevre Air Base, home of the USAG Benelux now. It used to be the staging area for one of the most famous warriors in history. Throughout Europe, a new type of warfare was taking place in the skies. Only the bravest souls would answer the call to put their lives on the line in new flying contraptions called aeroplanes. Five aerial victories would earn pilots the title of aerial ace, but no ace was more famous than Manfred von Richthofen, also known as the Red Baron. Richthofen was not always a pilot. He started the war as a cavalry dispatch rider on the front lines, and after seeing aerial combat from a distance, he became fascinated by the idea of being more involved with the war. After passing his flying exams, he was transferred to the Western Front to join his first unit. Commanded by Oswald Volk, an ace in his own right, Volk would train Richthofen in aerial combat to always fight when you have the advantage, and more importantly, to flee when your adversary is in a better position. Richthofen had shot down many enemy planes before, but had never received credit for the kill because the planes fell in enemy territory and could not be confirmed. In the first battle with his new unit, the thought of getting his first credited kill remained heavy on his mind. Little did he know that this would be the battle that started a legend. We approached the enemy squadron slowly, but he could no longer escape us. We were between the front and the enemy. If he wanted to go back, he would have to go by us. We counted seven enemy airplanes and opposed them with only five. At the time, I did not have the conviction I have now that he must fall, but rather I was much more anxious to see if he would fall, and that is a significant difference. Suddenly, his propeller turned no more, hit. The engine was probably shot to pieces and he would have to land near our lines. Reaching his own positions was out of the question. I noticed the machine swaying from side to side. Something was not quite right with the pilot. This was Richthofen's first credited victory, and after shooting down 16 planes, Richthofen was awarded one of Germany's top honors on January 12, 1917, as recognition of extraordinary personal achievement. Two days later, Richthofen was given command of his own unit. Now he was not only to fly and fight, but to train others to do so as well. Several other flyers had painted different areas of the planes special colors, but Richthofen felt it was still difficult to see the planes in the air. One day, for no particular reason, I got the idea to paint my crate glaring red. After that, absolutely everyone knew my red bird. In fact, even my opponents were not completely unaware. Until then, no one had been so bold as to paint their entire plane such a bright color. The red plane caused fear and earned respect from all who saw it in the air. And with that fear came many nicknames. The Red Devil, the Jolly Red Baron, and the Red Baron. However, the Germans never called Richthofen the Red Baron. Instead, they called him der Rote Kampfliger, or the Red Battle Flyer. Things were going Richthofen's way until a serious incident. While attacking several enemy planes, Richthofen was shot. Suddenly, there was a blow to my head. I was hit. For a moment, I was completely paralyzed. My hands dropped to the side, my legs dangled inside the fuselage. The worst part was that the blow to the head had affected my optic nerve and I was completely blinded. The machine dived down. Richthofen regained part of his eyesight and control of the aircraft seconds before crashing into the ground. Though he was able to land his plane, the wound kept Richthofen away from the front for some time and left him with frequent severe headaches. When the Red Baron returned to the air, he was never the same pilot he once was. Members of his unit noticed a distinct change in Richthofen's flying maneuvers as he began to stray from the training that his mentor, Oswald Bolk, taught him, taking unnecessary risks, something he never did prior to his injury. On April 21st, 1918, there had been a report that several British aircraft were near the front. Manfred von Richthofen climbs into his bright red plane for the last time. Breaking his own rules and chasing a lone plane too close to the ground, Richthofen was hit in the chest and his plane crashed in enemy territory. It is widely believed that the shot came from the ground, an unfitting end for a man who made his name in the clouds. Officers from the Australian Flying Corps buried Richthofen with full military honors at the cemetery in Bertangles, France on April 22, 1918. The Red Baron was credited with bringing down 80 enemy aircraft but historical estimates put that number at more than 130. His skills in the air made him a German hero and a legend. For Trenches to Foxholes, I'm Air Force Sergeant Stefan Patrick. I'm here now at the Samson Forian Military Cemetery. It's about 15 minutes from the Shape NATO base. But what makes it truly special is who built it 
He was buried here. The German army was victorious at the Battle of Mons, but the Brits that had held the city put up such a tenacious fight, the Germans decided to bury both their fallen soldiers and those of the British Empire they had defeated. Facing superior numbers, the Brits held their ground long enough to stop Germany's surging army from quickly reaching Paris in the early days of the war as planned, a development that many believe changed the course of the entire conflict. But this wasn't the only time that the Germans and the British came together during the Great War. It was the first year of battle, the holiday season, and the two sides came together in one of the most unlikely celebrations ever recorded. In 1914, the Great War, also known as World War I, had begun. It became defined by trenches, gas, biplanes, and the mass destruction in its wake. But one event has been lost to the pages of history. It's the Christmas truce of 1914. Well, the war broke out in August 1914. It's, uh, the war is said to be a big adventure. So many people think that around Christmas everything will be over. When Christmas arrives, so soldiers begin to imagine that it will not be finished at Christmas because they're in a ditch or in a trench somewhere. We came up to take over the trenches, the on, the the over the trenches on the front between Freilingen and Hopeling, where our regiment and the Scottish C4 Highlanders were face to face. It was a cold, starry night, and the Scots were 100 or so meters in front of us in their trenches, where, as we discovered, like us, they were up to their knees in mud. My company commander and I, savoring the unaccustomed calm, sat with our orderlies around a Christmas tree we had put up in our dugout. Lieutenant Johann Niemann, 133rd Royal Saxon Regiment. The Christmas truce, it came quite naturally. Uh, it's sometimes hard to explain. Nothing was prepared. Also, we, I mean, the Christmas truce in some areas here around lasted until the 10th of January. Of course, they didn't meet 10 days long or 15 days long in the field, but it was 10, 12 days ceasefire. There's some stories about, uh, you can read in diaries, that uh, the Germans are dropping a stone wrapped in paper in the British Trench. And they're saying we have an officer coming tomorrow for inspection, so maybe we could have to fire. So keep your heads down and we'll fire high enough. Right. So that was the beginning of what was called then later, live and let live. On Christmas Eve, there was a lot in the fighting. The Germans had a Christmas tree in the trenches and Chinese lanterns all along the top of a parapet. Eventually, the Germans started shouting, Come over, I want to speak to you. Our chaps hardly knew how to take this, but one of the nuts belonging to the regiment got out of the trench and started to walk towards the German lines. One of the Germans met him about halfway across and they shook hands and became quite friendly. So more of them took it in turns to go and visit the Germans. The officer commanding would not allow more than three men at a time. I went out myself on Christmas day and exchanged some cigarettes for cigars. And this game had been going on from Christmas Eve till midnight on Boxing Day without a single round being fired. Gunner Herbert Smith, 5th Battery, Royal Field Artillery. It's quite nice to be in a trench and uh, you know nobody will fire on you if you're going to walk a bit further or if you light a cigarette. Or, uh, and also the guys should have to bring some food from the rear quite every night. You know, you're supplied with food, with water, with tea, with uh, everything. So these guys also, it's a lot easier to walk to the front line if you're sure that nobody's firing on you. So something is installing himself. Mm -hmm. And that's why in some places it lasted quite long. And then once headquarters on both sides see what happens and they really active do something like let the artillery firing or moving regiments. And then yeah, the, the truce stopped as the war raised on, the Christmas truce of 1914 became a distant memory. But it is the only time in history where a war was put on hold. Summer is finally here, and that means barbecues, swimming, and straight up good times. But with the fun, hey, you guys want a hot dog? comes the damaging sun. And you're getting sun damage when you least expect it, like on a road trip. Even with the windows up and the air blasting, those sun rays are making their way in and damaging your skin. Another unlikely burn can occur when getting in and out of the pool. Summer Safety 411. Remember the safety during the fun. Many towns in Belgium saw heavy fighting during World War I. 
But there was one medieval village that saw the start of trench warfare, the use of poisonous gas, and nearly one million casualties. Ypres was strategically located between the German army and the Allied supply port on the English Channel. The intense fighting in and around this quiet little city made it a symbol of the harsh realities of the First World War and changed Ypres forever. It was completely razed to the ground, not a single stone left standing upon another. And in four years, nearly half a million people were killed here. Nearly everybody fled in the early days of the war. In the early days of the war, I mean when the front line was established near Ypres. However, some inhabitants stayed on until May, early May 1915. And on the 9th of May 1915, the last some 10 inhabitants still living in town were finally evacuated, which means that nobody lived in Ypres from May 1915 until spring 1919. It was literally a dead town. The only ones passing through it were military personnel from almost as much as 50 different countries. The front line ran to the north, to the east and to the south of the town, with the town really at its heart in the middle. As was very typical of the First World War, the front was stuck here, so it was trench warfare. The Second Battle of Ypres began on the 22nd of April 1915 at 5 p.m. sharp, and that's actually the very moment that the German army used gas for the first time. Very important moment in world history because it's, you can consider it the first use of a weapon of mass destruction. Some 2,000 mainly French soldiers were killed after a couple of hours. The Germans were able to break through the Allied lines. The result was that the front line came much closer to the town of Ypres. The consequence was that, uh, of course, all the Allied troops rallied together to stop the Germans, to block them. Ypres became a symbol, was considered holy ground, was considered a town which had to be held at all costs, which is one, not the only, but one of the reasons why so many dreadful battles had to follow in the, in, in the coming years and that so many casualties were claimed. The first inhabitants returned to their destroyed town in 1919 and reconstruction began two years later. While many of the battlefields left their traces in the landscape around Ypres, places such as the In Flanders Fields Museum and the Menin Gate ensure the atrocities of the Great War will never be forgotten. For Trenches to Foxholes, I'm Air Force Master Sergeant Jennifer Foster. This is a monument in the tiny village of ville sur about 10 minutes away from base and it marks the location of the last Commonwealth soldier killed during World War I. It was a Canadian named George Price, and he was fatally hit by a sniper just two minutes before the armistice went into effect at 11 o'clock on November 11, 1918, ending World War I. A peace that would only last about 20 years before the world was at war again. When we come back, we'll show you how Belgium once again played a pivotal role in the war with Germany. Ensure that you know we remain ready and, and stay in the game. I think it's critically important that we take care of ourselves. When I talk about taking care of ourselves, it's it's mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, and we find that work-life balance. It's also very important that we take care of our families. And if we identify a problem or we see somebody that needs help, we make sure we get them the help that they need. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. But before Allied troops could move the Nazis out of the area, they had to get into mainland Europe. Using amphibious assault forces, ground troops, and a new asset called the Airborne, Operation Overlord would give the Allies a foothold in Europe. And after months of planning, they decided the best place to start the offensive would be a place called Normandy. I'm here at the American Cemetery in Normandy, and it honors those who paid the ultimate sacrifice on the D-Day invasion of 1944. Behind me is a piece of land that would be known as Omaha Beach. By the end of 1943, 
Allied armies begun to turn the tide of the war, with strategic victories in North Africa, Italy, and the rest of the Mediterranean. They looked across the English Channel and set their sights on Germany-occupied France. By gaining a foothold on continental Europe, Allied armies could combine land, air, and sea power with the ability to resupply their troops and build on their gains. Due to tidal patterns and weather, only a few days out of each month would be favorable for an amphibious assault. General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, decided that June 6 would be the best time for an invasion. Shortly after midnight, more than 20,000 airborne troops landed off the coastline, and at 6.30 in the morning, the first wave of American, British, and Canadian forces landed on the beaches of Normandy. Soldiers and Marines waded through waist-deep water while artillery, landmines, and machine gun fire slowed their advance. The American 1st Infantry Division was tasked with taking a five-mile stretch of land, codenamed Omaha Beach. The Americans suffered more than 2,000 casualties in taking Omaha, more than the four other beachheads combined. Seventy years later, the D-Day invasion stands as one of the turning points in the Allied victory of World War II. The Normandy landings have become a symbol of honor, duty, sacrifice, and the ability to persevere against all odds. This year, the Boy Scouts of America held their jamboree at Omaha Beach to honor the sacrifices of those who fell and to learn more about the history of our nation's greatest generation. The jamboree brought together military families stationed overseas, European Scouts, and Boy Scouts of America leadership to celebrate our common history and heritage. Probably one of the greatest examples of courage and perseverance, and now it represents something more. It's an opportunity for kids from all across Europe to come together. Um, different scouts, different scout associations, not just the Boy Scouts of America, but we've invited a lot of other scout associations to come and have a great time. From crossover ceremonies to memorial services, the weekend-long jamboree combined the traditions of scouting and the significance of one of the turning points in world history. For us to demonstrate to the young men that we have stewardship over, the importance of, of kind of what those young men did before them and what they continue to do today it makes them understand dedication, service, and the kind of things that, that the American military represents for our country. The next morning, scouts would take the short trip from Omaha Beach to Bayou for a special ceremony. The town of Bayou sits four miles off the coast of the English Channel and is steeped in history. During the 9th century, Viking raids from Scandinavia raised the town, but it was rebuilt during the 10th century. Being so close to the beachheads of Normandy, it would hold a symbolic place in the days to come after the D-Day invasion. With Allied forces successfully establishing themselves on mainland Europe, they set their sights on pushing back the Axis forces, while simultaneously liberating towns that had been under German control. The town of Bayeux was the first town to be liberated on June 14, 1944, during the Battle of Normandy. Commander of the Free French Forces, Major General Charles de Gaulle, gave a speech two days later in Bayeux to symbolize the concept of a France free from external domination. Seventy years later, the town of Bayeux still holds significance for those who visit Normandy. On Saturday morning, scouts, parents, and troop leaders packed the Bayeux Cathedral for the unveiling of a peace bell to commemorate the Normandy landings. American scouts across Europe, French, British, and German scouts attended the ceremony, highlighting the international cooperation and unity among those in attendance. This was the design by the French government for the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And they, and they asked us as the, uh, as, the, as the initial event for the 70th anniversary as, uh, commemorations, if we would have a German scout, a French scout, a British scout, and an American scout symbolically unveil the bell to the public for the first time and to do the first, be the first pe people ever to ring the bell that will hang in the Bayou Cathedral. With more than a thousand people attending the service from many nations across Europe, the Peace and Liberty Bell unveiling is a symbol of cooperation and gratitude between nations. Bayou was the first town liberated on D-Day in, uh, in uh, 1944 and this spells a reminder of all the sacrifices that were made that made the, that made the freedom of Western Europe possible. 
Scouts came away from the ceremony knowing that history and lessons learned can be passed down from one generation to the next. For Trenches to Foxholes, I'm Raymond First Class, Eli Rios. Ensure that you know we remain ready and, and stay in the game. I think it's critically important that we take care of ourselves. When I talk about taking care of ourselves, it's, it's mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, and we find that work-life balance. It's also very important that we take care of our families. And if we identify a problem or we see somebody that needs help, we make sure we get them the help that they would need. After liberating France from Nazi occupation, Allied forces headed north into Belgium. They were met with fierce fighting, and in the winter of 1944, the war turned to a stalemate around a little Belgian village called Bastogne. Not many people have the honor and the privilege to interview a real World War II veteran. Here's just a small piece of Staff Sergeant John Leather's World War II story. Throughout Europe, the conflict to liberate it was hard-fought battle, including harsh conditions, lack of supplies, and the odds stacked against them. The U.S. forces with their courageous spirit pushed on. One such story was the events that led Staff Sergeant John Leather of F Company 194th Glider, 17th Airborne Division, from the United Kingdom all the way to the hills of Belgium. Well, at first, I was stationed in England, flew across the channel, Christmas Eve, 44. And uh, we went down to um, Sedan, France, uh, patrol the Meuse River, and there's a bridge there, Sedan, France, the only bridge that carried the heavy armor. That's why we were there. And while we were there, every night at 10 o'clock, there'd be a fighter plane come in. He'd cut his engine downstream, you know, glide in until he got to the bridge. He was trying to blow that bridge out. And also, we, uh, we patrolled the river because we heard that the uh, Germans were dropping paratroopers in upstream and leaving them float down, trying to blow that bridge. And uh, we called that plane Bed Check Charlie because he'd come in every night at 10 o'clock. John had many missions in World War II, but his most important was the care of his troops, whether it be on patrol or in the middle of a firefight with an unknown enemy in the middle of the night. I took the squad out on patrol, uh, watched the river. I thought one night was we were getting a firefight with the free French because they were patrolling the other side of the river. And uh, I, I didn't see them right away. And they didn't see us until they kicked a can accidentally over there, got my attention. We stopped and then they watched or spotted us. And they stopped. I told the squad, I said, get ready to hit the ground. I think we're in for a firefight. But we just stood there and watched each other. Finally, they moved out, and then we moved on out. From his patrols in the Meuse River in France, John then moved his squad into Belgium, into a small town just three miles from Bastogne. Well, later on, we moved up to this area after the Patton. I uh, broke through to the 101st Airborne Division here in Bastogne. John later found out that he didn't have to take his troops to the town. For trenches to foxholes, I'm Army Sergeant Zachary Bird. All throughout World War II, Allied bombers flew missions to help destroy the Nazi war machine. 
Sometimes their targets were deep into Nazi Germany, and the long flight from England left bombing crews exposed to enemy fighters and flak from German guns. Our next story is about one of those brave bomber crews. When you're young, you think you're invincible. But as the men on the Royal Flush found out on that day in 1944, all of that can change in the blink of an eye. It was fairly calm going to Swanford. Then when we turned to make the bomb run, uh, I saw the flak they were using over Swanford. The solid wall of black flag and uh, the uh, group ahead of us flew into it, just disappeared like going into a heavy cloud bank. And it was, I was wondering how you could fly through that, you know. But soon we were in it and it wasn't as bad inside as it looked. Then we was uh, calm all the way back then till we got to the navigator called. We were 10 minutes from the channel. And then they started firing four guns at us right about then. I stood there uh, with my cheek against a warm electric gun sight and watched the artillery burst off of our wingtip. The red flash of the explosion and so on till one knocked the tip of a wing off. Then when the pilot got it back down and leveled off, the rest of the wing was getting on fire. And when we opened the bomb bay doors, I, I stepped out on a catwalk. The bomb bay doors was open, so I just put my arms around my uh, trigger that you pull on the parachute so it wouldn't catch you nothing and just stepped off the catwalk. Even though Sergeant Holler made it out of the aircraft and all the way to the ground safely, his troubles were just beginning. I walked across a pasture and I just got in a patch of woods and I heard people calling and I looked back. Two civilians were motioning frantically for me to come back, hurry back. So I went, hurried back to where they were and they were walking fast toward the house. I had to trot to keep up with them. About halfway to this house, uh, the enemy soldiers started firing at us and went, went around the house. There's a big haystack there with a hole on it down at the ground. And I crawled under that real fast and they shoved straw back in the hole and then I, just a matter of seconds I heard them out, the, the soldiers and the civilians talking. And after a while it became quiet and I found out later that they asked which way I went and the civilians told them I went on down the road. And so that's the way they went down the road looking for me. After spending months in hiding and wondering whether he would ever make it home, Tech Sergeant Holler did make it back to the States and now lives well into his 90s. For Trenches to Foxholes, I'm Army Sergeant Jake Marlin. After the liberation of Belgium, Allied troops crossed into Germany and right into the Nazis' backyard. With the Russians closing in from the east and the Allies coming from the west, the Nazis had little choice but to surrender. And on May 8, 1945, the war in Europe would come to an end. During the war, over 60 million people lost their lives, and some of the worst fighting took place inside Belgium. That is why, on the 70th anniversary of the Normandy landings, the liberation of Belgium, and the Battle of the Bulge, we salute the greatest generation. For Trenches to Foxholes, I'm Air Force Master Sergeant Jennifer Foster. Thanks for watching.